We're going to be looking today, we're going to be looking today at Luke chapter 13, verse 10. That's Luke chapter 13, verse 10. As it comes up on the screen, so far we've discussed, we discussed the doctrine of God's word. We discussed the doctrine of salvation. We've discussed the law and grace. And tonight we're going to discuss the topic of the Sabbath. Amen? Amen? All right. Luke 13 and verse 10 says, now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the what? And the Bible says, and behold, there was a woman. There was a what? A woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent. She was what? She was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. And the Bible says, but when Jesus saw her, he called to him. He, sorry, he called her to him and said to her, woman, what did he say? Woman. He says, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And the Bible says, and he, and he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Let's go to the next verse. Verse 14 says, but the rulers of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days of which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them, but not on the Sabbath day. And the Bible says, the Lord then answered him and said, hypocrite. What's that word? Y'all think sometimes Jesus softened the blow with everything. Jesus said it as it was. What was that word that Jesus used? He said, hypocrite, do not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it. And the Bible says, so ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years be loosed from the bonds on the Sabbath. The last verse says, And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for all of the glorious things that were done by him. Tonight, I want to preach on the subject, God's day is greater. Do y'all believe that tonight? God's day is greater. If you believe that, would you clap your hands as you take your seats tonight? God's day is greater. Father in heaven, tonight we thank you for your word. And Father, I dare not speak ahead of you. And so, Father, I ask that I follow you as you lead tonight. Father, think through my mind. Speak through my mouth. And stand up in my body. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say amen. 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 Tonight, we see a very interesting situation. We see a situation about a woman... Who has an infirmity for 18 years, the Bible says. How many years? 18 years this woman has this infirmity. And the Bible says that she was so disabled that she was actually bent over. And so she spent her day and her nights not being able to look people in the face. She spent her day and her, and her evenings not being able to do routines the way that everybody else does. She spent her days and her nights not being able to get up the way that everybody else does. Sit the way that everybody else does. Sleep the way that everybody else does. She's not able to go to the gym. She's not able to hang out with her friends. She's not able to clean the house the way that she wants to. Every single thing that ought to be a regular routine became something difficult and something challenging for this woman. The Bible actually says for 18 years she's bent over. For 18 years other people are able to look at other people in the eye. But for 18 years she only sees their shoes. For 18 years people are able to bend down and tie their laces. But for 18 years she's got to ask someone to help her out. For 18 years people can stand up and look in the mirror. But for 18 years she has to look at the ground and wonder how how she looks on the outside. For 18 years, this woman's life is a challenge. 
But I wish I could tell you tonight that Jesus loves everybody. Jesus doesn't just love the fixed, but Jesus also loves those who are facing challenges. Because the Bible doesn't say she found Jesus, but the Bible says that Jesus found her. I wish I had a witness in this house tonight. How many of y'all can I admit that even on our best day, we could not find Jesus? But when we were down and messed up and cracked up and, and looking all jacked up and we had messed up reputations and did things we were not proud of and could not speak of that we did not find Jesus but Jesus went and found us oh y'all too quiet in this place how many y'all know that when we were in the pubs and the bar that we didn't find Jesus but Jesus found us how many y'all know that when we were lying and stealing that we didn't find Jesus but Jesus found us how many y'all know that when your kids were running the streets your kids didn't find Jesus but Jesus found them and if I can't talk about no Nobody else can I talk about you and I tonight how many y'all know that we didn't find Jesus but Jesus found us I'm so glad that Jesus looks for us and he searches for us and he pursues us and that he finds us let me tell you, I'm so glad tonight that God doesn't search for us by the way that we look because we can dress good and we smell good and we look good and we're educated and we drive nice cars. But how many y'all know that when Jesus looks at us, he doesn't look at what we look like on the outside, but he sees who we are on the inside. And I'm so glad that my God knows who I am. Someone say he knows my name. Do I have a witness in this place, y'all? Let me tell you, people will bypass us because they think we have it all together. People will think our lives are well and splendid and that they're glorious because they're looking on our outside. But I'm so glad that Jesus looks beyond the pasted mask of a fake smile and he knows when our lives are a hot mess and God is not too busy to take out his time and care for us. How many of y'all know that God is willing to travel whatever distance? He's willing to do whatever task. He's willing to take off any day at work to spend time with us. Jesus is a man who loves sinners. I'm so glad that we're not Jesus because I couldn't love sinners. I could barely like sinners. Y'all ain't hearing me in this place, y'all. But Jesus loves sinners. He loves people who make mistakes. He loves people who have addictions. He loves people who has challenges. He loves people whose names are, are catastrophically a mess. He loves people who have a bad transcript. He loves people who got laid off at their job. He loves people who have bad infirmities on the inside. He loves people who fail classes. Jesus loves sinners. And tonight if you find yourself in a place where you are a sinner and your life is a mess and you don't look on the outside what you look like on the inside, congratulations. Because Jesus wants to be your friend. I feel like preaching. I'm in a preaching mood tonight, y'all. And so the Bible says that she catches Jesus' attention. And let me tell y'all something. There's a reason why Jesus didn't go to her, but there's a reason why Jesus called her to come to him. It was not because he was domineering. It was not because he was a male. It was not because Jesus was disabled. It was not because Jesus couldn't walk. But the reason why Jesus told her to come to him is because Jesus doesn't force himself on anyone. We've got to stop forcing Jesus on people. We've got to stop forcing the gospel on people. We've got to stop forcing Adventism on people. We've got to stop forcing vegetarianism on people. Would you just let Jesus do his job? Sometimes the reason why people can't come to Christ is because you're trying to get them to come to you. But if you could get out of Jesus' way, God has done a job in the past. He's doing a job now. And God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ever think or imagine yes he can stop forcing people to come to your rigid religiosity and routines people don't want to meet rules people don't want to meet religion and religiosity what people want to meet first is Christ whenever you find people who follow rules without a relationship with Christ it is nothing more than legalism and legalism doesn't get you to heaven because I told y'all one of the problems that we face as a church that knows it all is that we know the truth but we don't have the truth 
Y'all not hearing me in this place, y'all. Did y'all know you can know the truth and not have the truth? Because knowing the truth means you know what's right. The Bible says that Jesus says, I am the truth. It is possible for you to know the truth. You know a whole bunch of facts. You can quote scripture. You know the spirit of prophecy backwards. But guess what? If you are not a nice person, you know the truth, but you don't have the truth. Oh, I feel like preaching it here. If you can treat the person next to you less than, you don't have the truth. You just know the truth. And heaven is not a place for those who know it all. Heaven is a place of those who have it all because they've got Christ in their lives. Don't tell me what you know. Show me what you know. You've got to live that thing. The Bible didn't say that the word just was the word, but the Bible says the word put on flesh and dwelt among us, which means Jesus set the example that we can't just speak the gospel and preach the gospel and teach the gospel, but we've got to live the gospel. No one wants someone standing and preaching and teaching in front of them whose lives are a hot mess. And I meet it all the time. People who want to teach and people who want to preach and they can't treat their wives right. Their kids don't have respect for them. They don't feel loved. Y'all got to hear me in this place, y'all, because I came to preach to everybody. People don't want to know what you know. They first want to know who you know. Oh, I'm preaching, and y'all don't have to tell me nothing, because I know I'm preaching tonight. Can you live this thing? He said, come to me. I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to force healing on you. I'm not going to force myself to fix your marriage. I'm not going to force myself to fix your relationships. I'm not going to force myself to come into your job. I'm not going to force myself to bless your classroom. I'm not going to force myself to fix your finances. I'm not going to force myself to bring up your credit score. I don't force myself on anyone. Christ never forced himself on anyone. Christ gave the call and those who wanted received. Are y'all with God tonight? And listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says that when she came to Jesus, that Jesus healed her. You want to know where I believe her healing began? Y'all want to hear this tonight? I believe her healing began simply because she was obedient. Can I tell you that there's healing and obedience to God and his word? Let me tell you what I'm not saying. I am saying you must come to Christ. But what I'm not saying is that you can't follow him. We've got to have the right driving force for following everything God says. If your driving force for doing everything God says is just because he said to do it, you've missed the mark. Tonight, our driving force for keeping God's commandments and following God's laws and being obedient to God's commands ought not be out of legalism, but it ought to be out of love. Love ought to be the driving force why we do what God asks us to do. Because eventually, the one who keeps the law, who doesn't have Christ, gets tired of doing it. I'm going to tell y'all tonight. The reason why we ought to keep God's law is because we love him. And if you want me to back that up with a text, I'll tell you the Bible says, the Bible says, he who loves me keeps my commandments. If you love me, do what? Show me that you love me. Show me that thing. I want you to be so in love with Christ that the reason why we don't want to mess with breaking God's commandments is because we love God so much and we don't want to hurt the God who loves us. And so the Bible says that Jesus heals her. And that wasn't the problem in the text. Every time God is doing a good thing, there's always got to be some folks who got to find something bad and wrong with it. Did y'all hear what I said? Every single time God is doing a good thing in our lives, there's always got to be someone who has got to find fault and dampen and dirt, and they will search high and low to make a good thing a bad thing. Are y'all listening to me tonight, y'all? And let me tell y'all something. If you are in a place where God is doing something good in your life, and you've got folks looking high and low to find the fault in your lives, congratulations. You know why? Because they did it to Christ. As a young minister, I remember years ago when I was in my first pastoral district, I had a hard time when I was pastoring because they said I was young. How could they know this much? 
spend a few more years pastoring and come back and talk to us. Actually, you want to know what some folks told me? You were sent here so that we could train you how to pastor. Adventist folk, y'all know folk like that. They say, you're going to be our child when you can. We're going to teach you some things. When you're done with us, you can pass to any church because we are a hard church. That's not Christ-like. That's crazy. Y'all ain't, I'm going to call it what it is. That's demonic. Amen. And God don't like that. God ain't coming back for that kind of church. Hello. And so let me tell y'all. When people find fault, I remember when I called my president the first time, when I told myself I'm having a hard time with this church, move me. Move me or I'm leaving this conference. I'm going somewhere else. My president sat me down and he says, well, well, before you make a hasty decision, let me holler at you for a second. And he moved from behind his desk and he sat down next to me on the couch. And he said, he said, how many disciples did Jesus have? I told him how many disciples he had. He said, let me ask you a question. He said, how many disciples betrayed Jesus? I said, one. He said, how many disciples denied Jesus? I said, another one. He said, okay. He said, so if you do the math, Jesus has pretty much an 80% success rate. He says, why are you trying to drive for 100? Do you think you're better than Jesus? Whenever you are leading, everyone will not always follow. I'm talking to a leader in this place. Because leadership is not about position. Leadership is about influence. And if you're waiting to be a leader based on a nominating committee, you've got the wrong thing coming. You are a leader if you're in a position of influence. If you have influence in your house, you're a leader. If you've got influence on your job, you're a leader. If you've got influence in your classroom, you are a leader tonight. And you will never have everybody following you as a leader. Because not everybody followed Christ. And if everyone can follow Christ, what makes you think you're better than Christ? If they found fault in God in the flesh, what makes you think folks ain't going to try to find fault on you? Am I preaching tonight? Can I preach tonight? So what happens? The Bible says that they look to find fault. Well, this woman is healed. She's been coming to the synagogue. No one could heal her. They've called the elders. She couldn't get healed. They've anointed this woman. She couldn't get healed. They brought her to the doctor's office. She couldn't get healed. They did surgery on this woman. She couldn't get healed. She saw the best physicians, the best hospitals, the best specialists, and this woman is still bent over. But Jesus shows up and heals her. All this could do is validate Jesus' ministry. Jesus was not big for words. If y'all know this, how Jesus, some of y'all could take a lesson on how to deal with people. Every time someone does something, we don't have to have the last word. And we got to stop it. Can I talk to my people because we black in here? Is that all right, y'all? Sometimes we got to be black and have the last word. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Uh-uh, I, 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 I got to get it off my mind. I got, uh-uh, I'm going to say this. And I'm gonna, no, 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 no. Look how Jesus handled people who did him wrong. All he did was he didn't answer them with a statement. He always answered people with a question. And the reason why is because it left them in a position for them to think. There are some battles we've got to stop fighting. And some things we've got to stop saying. And some ways we've got to stop rebuttling with people and making people know how we feel. If you're looking for someone to empathize with your feelings tonight, there's one person who can and that's Christ. Because Christ is willing to crawl into the ditch and sit with us at our loneliest, darkest, most despairing moments. And so Jesus heals this woman and they find fault. Why? They find fault with him because he healed this woman on the Sabbath. Did y'all hear that? And so the question is, is, is what makes the Sabbath so special? Can y'all look up at the screen? I know what time it is. We're going to end on time tonight. Y'all say amen. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 10. Are y'all still with the pastor tonight? Yeah. Exodus 20, verse 10 says, it's going to be up on the screen. I think they were so into my sermon that they, they forgot. I said, pastor, amen, amen. Exodus 20 and verse 10 says, but the seventh day, but the what day? But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, no, 
nor your sons, nor your daughters, nor your male servants, nor your female servants, nor your cattle, nor your strangers that are within your gates. The next verse says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed. What's that word? Therefore the Lord did what? He blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You want to know what the difference is between the Sabbath and the other days of the week? Two things. Number one, the seventh day is blessed. It's the only day of the week that God calls blessed. Y'all, y'all done missed it. See, some of y'all are looking for blessings in your lives, and y'all are praying for blessings, and y'all are begging for blessings, and y'all are petitioning for blessings, and y'all are waking up at 6 a.m., asking a prayer line for God to bless you, and y'all don't realize that when you come into the Lord's house on the Sabbath, you are blessed. All you've got to do sometimes is show up in God's presence, and God will bless you. Ain't no staying home on Sabbath, y'all. Unless you are seriously sick, you should be in the house of the Lord on Sabbath. Because there's a blessing you get on worshiping the Lord in his house on his day that you won't get anywhere else. Y'all know how crazy I am. On Sabbath mornings, I ask the Lord when I pull into, I always make sure I'm the first one on Sabbath morning. I make sure I'm the first person in this parking lot on Sabbath morning at my church. And when I pull in, I always say a prayer in my car. I ask the Lord, bless your house so much on the Sabbath that when people drive by your church, they've got to feel something different because your presence is here on the Lord's day. That's how potent God's presence is. On The second thing about the Sabbath is, yes, God blesses us on the Sabbath, but the Bible says that the Sabbath day is holy. God showed how he treated the Sabbath. He blessed the day. Now, God has an expectation from us on the Sabbath. And the expectation is is that we treat the Lord's day holy. What does the word, what was the word holy mean? The word holy means set apart. Did y'all hear what I said? The word holy means set apart. If someone said to me, Pastor, well, if we have to worship the Lord on the Sabbath, can't we worship him every day of the week? We should worship the Lord every day week. And I said, absolutely. So, Pastor, I don't need to come to church on Sabbath. Because I worship the Lord every day of the week. And here's what I told them. I said, listen, yes, you can go to church every day of the week if you want. But there is one day that ought to be set apart than other days because the Bible says it's holy, which means whatever happens on that day is set apart and ought to be climactic. Y'all didn't hear what I said. Did y'all hear what I said? Do I have to talk about my wife? Because my wife is tired of me talking to her, talking about her. Y'all hearing me? Let me put it like this. I dated high and low. Did y'all hear me? High and low. Did y'all hear what I said? I dated many, but there was something set apart about my wife. That's why she made it past date three. Amen? And that's why she's my wife. Amen? Amen? Y'all better say amen like y'all sitting next to someone y'all happy to be married to because your wife is going to knock you on the way. Y'all better say say amen. Say amen again. Come on. Y'all looking at me crazy. Y'all better act like y'all know the feeling. Pretend. Amen. Where did the Sabbath come from? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, the Bible says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But uh, chap- Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 to 3 says, By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. Let me tell y'all something tonight. God created the earth in seven days. I always ask people how long did creation ask, and I hate when Seventh day Adventists tell me six days. Creation did not last six days, creation lasted seven days. You know why? Because the Sabbath did not exist till God created it. So God still created the Sabbath on the seventh day. Y'all didn't hear what I said, y'all. So the question now is, is why did God create something? God could have ended creation week on six days and we'd have six days on the calendars. It's because God knew that he was designating a special day and a special time to have with you. Let me tell y'all, I hate dealing with my allergy doctor. I deal with bad sinuses, and I'm a young guy, I'm a thin guy, I'm, I'm, I'm almost thin. Y'all pray for me. Someone said to me, Pastor, you losing weight. I said, no, I'm learning how to wear shirts my size. Y'all hearing me tonight, y'all? 
let me tell y'all. When I sleep at night, I snore really bad. Y'all pray for my wife. So what I have to do is try to keep myself awake until she falls asleep if I expect to wake up and still find her in the bed. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Because I tell my wife my living room couch can't wrap their arms around her. Y'all say amen, married folk. Hello. Amen. I'm single, happy, and saved. Amen. And let me tell y'all something. When I sleep at night, I sleep with a machine on me. And I oftentimes have to go see my allergy doctor. And the reason why me and my allergy doctor always fret is because it always takes me three months to see my allergy doctor because I live in Wichita, Kansas in the middle of nowhere. Are y'all hearing me? And I hate having to wait three months. The honest truth is, is sometimes my town is so small that the movie theater gets so full that if you were going to see a Christian movie, amen, because y'all looking at me crazy in here. If you're going to see a Christian movie, you may have to wait several shows. Let me put it in your language. If you went to a restaurant like Friday's or a restaurant like Cheddar's or a nice restaurant, sometimes the wait is two to three hours on a Saturday evening. Are y'all listening to me? I hate waiting for things. I'm still praying for patience. But I'm so glad that we don't have to wait for God. Because the Bible says we don't have to book an appointment. We don't have to speak to his secretary. We don't have to ask him if he has time. We don't have to check to see if he's busy. Every single week, God has mapped out time to spend with you and with me. Y'all should have said amen. God is not too busy. God said, I knew you were going to be too busy. I know y'all were going to be chasing dollars and euros and pounds. But he said, listen, I need you to set aside some time every single week so that we could spend time with one another. And so God has designated the Sabbath as a time to spend with one another. There is a belief in the body sometimes. There's a belief in the body of Christ among some other people that the Sabbath changed. Are y'all hearing me? And I want to share with y'all that the Sabbath did not change. Are y'all listening to me? Let let me show y'all from scripture because I'm not a philosopher. I'm a pastor. Amen. Let's look at Psalms chapter 89 verse 34. I see the time and we're going to end on time. Y'all say amen. Psalms chapter eight, chapter 89, Psalms 89 verse 34 says, it says my covenant, my what? The word covenant is interchangeable with the word law. My covenant I will not break. I will not what? Say it one more time. I will not what? I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Did y'all hear me? Now, let me tell y'all, we've had a lot of people break promises in our lives. I don't know about y'all, but I've had a lot of people break promises in our lives. And let me tell you something, I'd like to play the victim, but can I be honest, y'all? I've broken a whole lot of promises in my life. Are y'all hearing me? And let me tell y'all tonight, tonight I'm so glad that God is not like you and I when we break promises. Because the Bible says that God maintains every promise that comes out of his lips. And the Bible says, my covenant I will not violate. In essence, my law I will not change. Once it has gone out of my lips, when I say something, I mean it. You can take that check to the bank and you can cash it. Because when God says something, it shall come to pass and it will not change. Y'all don't believe me? Let's go to Luke chapter 16, verse 17. Luke 16, verse 17. The Bible says, and it is easier. It is what? It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tithe, one tithe of the law to fail. Did y'all hear that? God said, before I change my law, you will see heaven and earth fall apart. Did y'all hear me? Have y'all seen heaven and earth fall apart yet? What that means is is God's law still stands. Touch someone and say it still stands. Well, let me tell y'all. The question is, is did Jesus keep the Sabbath? Let me show y'all that Jesus kept the Sabbath. The Bible says in Luke chapter 4 verse 16, Luke 4 verse 16 says, So he came to Nazareth. Where did he go? He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went. Let me back up for a second. As his what was? As his what was? As his, if y'all looking for how to follow Jesus, make sure y'all found in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. Y'all say amen. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Jesus kept the Sabbath. And not only did he keep the Sabbath, he went to church on the Sabbath. I meet some people who say, Pastor, I'm staying home on Sabbath. I can stay home and still be blessed, and I can catch church on the internet. It is not the same watching church on the internet as it is coming into the Lord's house on the Lord's day. 
I'm, I, I must have walked down someone's pew because y'all quiet now. Uh-oh. Can I, can I pastor y'all for a second? There's few people I allow to stay home on Sabbath that I ain't going to bother. The only time I, I allow someone to stay home on, uh, on Sabbath or I send someone home from church on Sabbath is if your spouse is sick. If your spouse is sick and you come into my office and think you're going to serve on my pulpit and lead my church, I'm sending you home. And I've sent my elders home on a Sabbath morning when I've showed them Max, where is your wife? She's sick with the flu. I told them, go home. Pastor, I have to do scary. I said, no, your first church is your home. You go home, tell your wife she can send me a thank you text later. Did y'all, um, can I pastor y'all for a second? Can I teach y'all? For, I know I'm young, but I, I got a little something to share with y'all. Your first church is your house. Y- y'all hear me, y'all? If you can't do devotion with your family, you have no business leading Sabbath school in the church. Y'all need to hear what I'm saying. And I'm not condemning no one. I'm challenging you all. Because there was a time when I didn't do devotion in my house. And I was quick to go and lead in front of God's church. And my wife said, it's so great that I get to have a great pastor, but I want a shepherd in my house. And I said, before I leave my house, I need to always make sure my family's taken care of. So y'all know who has devotion? Me, my wife, and my dog. And my dog even joins us for prayer before we leave the house. King, come to the door. King, sit down. Y'all hear me? Y'all, y'all mess. I'm going to show y'all a picture of King on Friday. Someone asked me if I have a son. Yes, his name is King. Y'all pray for the preacher tonight. There are some people who believe the Sabbath was only for the Jews. And there are even some groups who preach real hard nowadays. Y'all know who I'm talking about. They scream with microphones on the streets and they'll tell you that they are Jews and the Sabbath is just for them. Y'all need to be careful. Let's take a look at scripture and what the Bible says. Was the Sabbath just for Jews? Isaiah 56 verse 2. If y'all get mad that I have, that I have so much scripture, I'm so sorry. I don't want no one leaving thinking I'm a good philosopher. I preach from the word. Amen? And you don't have to write. It's printed. And if you don't have a sheet, we'll give you one before you leave. Isaiah 56 verse 2 says, blessed. What's that word? Say it one more time. What's that word? Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keep from defiling the Sabbath, who keep from what? And keep his hands from doing any evil. Verse 6 to 7 says, are y'all there? Isaiah 56 verse 6 to 7 says, Also the sons of the foreigners, the sons of the what? Who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and who holds Fast my covenant. Verse 7 says, even them I will bring to my holy mountain. Y'all should have said amen. Amen. Y'all know the foreigners is speaking about? Non-Jews. He says he calls non-Jews to come and take part in the Sabbath. And this is what the reward is. Even then I will bring to my what? Y'all know what the holy mountain is? It's speaking about heaven. Even then I will bring them to my holy mountain and make them joyful in the house of prayer. Their burnt offerings, their sacrifices will be accepted to my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all what? Come on, y'all. I like, I, I like, when you go to the original language, you'll find that the same word nations actually means all people. Amen? So the question is, some people say, well, pastor... The law was changed. The Sabbath was changed when Jesus died on the cross. Are y'all hearing me? Can I show y'all that the Sabbath was not changed when Jesus died on the cross? Don't worry. I know what time is we going to get out. We on Holy Ghost time. I'm going to get y'all out in a moment. Acts 13 verse 42 to 44 says. Verse 42 and verse 44. So we're going to jump from 42 to 44. It says, also Paul and Barnabas were going out. The people kept begging these two, these things, that these things might be spoken to them The next Sabbath. Did y'all hear that? Did y'all hear what I just said? Let me read that one more time. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. After Jesus died, y'all see what book this is? This is what book? It's the book of Acts. Acts was written after Jesus died. 
We got the books Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We understand the book of Acts is the second half of one of the Gospels. We know that, right? One of the authors penned, one of the disciples penned the book of Acts. After Jesus died, Paul and Barnabas were still going to church on the Sabbath. Why would they still be going to church on the Sabbath if the Sabbath was changed? Okay, y'all don't believe me. Let me show y'all another one. Verse 44 says, the next Sabbath, the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. A second time. Did y'all hear that? Did Jesus change the Sabbath? No, Jesus did not change the Sabbath. They were still keeping the Sabbath after Jesus died. And I don't have enough time for me to tell you how Constantine changed the Sabbath. But I have enough time to tell you that Jesus Christ never changed the Sabbath. My last text tonight is Isaiah 66, 22 to 23. This is where we close tonight. The last text tonight. Isaiah 66, 22 to 23. And then we're going to stand and pray. Did y'all have a good time in the Lord tonight? The Lord really wanted me to shut me up because my iPad just died. That, that's definitely an amen. The Lord said, you're going to keep your promise. I kept mine. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your, your, your descendants and your name remain. Verse 23 says, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. It's speaking about heaven. Did y'all hear me? From one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another. Not only will we keep the Sabbath here on earth, but we look forward to keeping the Sabbath in heaven. Y'all want to know why that's my favorite Bible text? Because I'm probably the only one who has to work on Sabbath as a pastor. And I'm so glad when I go to heaven, I'm going to have every Sabbath off. Your first elder is going to have every Sabbath off because we ain't going to be leading and preaching and praying and visiting. We're going to be standing and shouting and singing and casting our crowns at the feet of Jesus, saying glory to God in the highest. Y'all say amen. If y'all want to go to heaven, would y'all jump up on your feet? We got to pray tonight, y'all. I am so happy for the Sabbath. The Lord said, I am Lord of the Sabbath. No one's going to tell me how to keep the Sabbath because I created the Sabbath. I am Lord of the Sabbath. It is just to do good on the Sabbath. Your heads are bowed and your eyes closed. Tonight, there's someone in the sound of my voice. You are not a member of God's church, but God is speaking to you night after night. And tonight, God spoke to you. And as we prepare to pray, if your head is bowed and your eyes closed and you want to say, Pastor, I want to be a member of God's church. I want to become a member of God's church. Well, my pianist plays something for me tonight. Tonight, you want to say, Pastor, I heard God talk to me. And I want to become a member of God's church. I want to study more of God's word. I want to be in a deeper relationship with Jesus. I don't want this week to be like any other week. But this week, God is talking to me. God is knocking at the door of my heart. And I want to make that decision. My life is not together. Everything is not, all my ducks aren't lined up. Uh, my life doesn't look like someone who has it all together. But pastor, even though my life is a mess, and I am a sinner, I don't want to clean myself up to come to God. Because you can't clean yourself up. But if you're not a member of God's church tonight, and you want to say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. But you want to say, Pastor, pray for me because I want to become a member of God's church. Pastor, pray for me, for me, for me. Everyone's heads is bowed and everyone's eyes closed. This is between you and God tonight. Pastor, pray for me because I want to become a member of God's church. If that's your desire tonight, would you lift your hand wherever you are? Pastor, pray for me. I want to make that decision. I want to make that bold decision. It's not been easy. It's not been hard. No one knows my story. But I want to make that decision tonight. I want to make that decision tonight. Would y'all put your hands together tonight? Put your hands together. We're going to celebrate someone who made that decision. Put your hands together tonight. Put your hands together tonight. There's someone else before I close tonight. God is talking to you. He's knocking at the door of your heart. And he's saying, I want to become your Lord and your Savior. You want to make that decision and say, Lord, I want to be a member of your church. I want to be one with you. 
you're saying, Pastor, I want to study. I want to study God's word. I want to become a member of God's church. If that's your desire tonight, would you just lift your hand wherever you are? We're going to close in 30 seconds. You want to make that decision. I see someone in the sound room. Would y'all put your hands together for the little one in the sound room? Put your hands together for the little one in the sound room. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Is there another one tonight? You want to make that decision before we close. You want to become a member of God's church tonight. You want to become a member of God's church. This is not the finish line. This is the starting line. He takes you as you are. This is not my church. This is not our church. This is his church. Would you make that decision tonight before we close? Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you tonight for speaking to all of us in this place. If the truth be told, we don't look at the woman who was bent over. We are the woman who was bent over. All of our lives have been broken. We've been paralyzed because of sin. And Father, if the truth be told, we don't know how to walk straight. Because we don't know what a straight life looks like until we look at Christ. And Father, tonight we realize that we don't want to just know the truth. Lord, we want to have the truth in our lives. We want to have Christ in our lives. We don't just want to know facts. But we want to have a relationship with you just as importantly tonight. And tonight we don't want to do away with the law. We believe in the law. And we know that you've called us into this day of rest. So that we can be rejuvenated in you. And be prepared for heaven. Would you bless your children tonight? And Father, if we've never kept a Sabbath yet, we look forward to keeping this coming Sabbath. Bless your family. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the Redeemer of the Lord say so by saying the words, Amen. I don't need a round of applause, but would y'all give the Lord of the Sabbath a round of applause? Would y'all give the Lord a round of applause tonight? He gave you those hands. God bless you tonight. I love you all. Thank you for bearing with me and being...